I'm Dr. Upadhyay, Daya Upadhyay, and I'm a faculty at uh, Stanford uh, University Hospital. And I'm I specialize in pulmonary and critical care medicine, which is, of course, a lung. And that's, what, that's, that's close to my heart. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, certainly, um, you know, uh, what, we, what we'll be talking today is living better with COPD. And the fact that you're here, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that you all know a little bit about this. Or maybe, you know, you will learn a lot or you may have some questions about it. Um, this is a perfect, I think, this particular image you are well familiar with, isn't it? Yes, okay. The, the month actually has been chosen is perfect, and I thank Nora for choosing month of November because November is COPD Awareness Month, particularly November 16th, and uh, we like to educate our patients and also get some feedback about what exactly they need and how should we proceed with advances in the management as well as in sort of improving your care. Uh, it's a partnership. It's not only the physician proposed things, but also we need to understand what are your needs and how to improve our care. Okay? So what is COPD? It's a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it means that there is a obstruction which has been going on for a long time. Okay? Initially, it is reversible. At a later stage, it becomes permanent. Okay? And in COPD, there are two types. One is called as emphysema, and other is chronic bronchitis. It is the fourth leading cause of death in the world, in the US, particularly in the US and also in the world. There are about 12 million Americans diagnosed with this disease, and some of them don't even know about it. Okay. They're present with some other symptoms and get diagnosed with COPD. Perhaps more troubling is COPD goes underdiagnosed. Many a times, patients have not been told about it. Many a times, patients are minimally symptomatic. That means the shortness of breath is not so much to limit your activity. And therefore, it goes misdiagnosed or the diagnosis is delayed. As a result, the disease progress and the response of the treatment is delayed. What happens, the progression of disease occurs and the mortality increases. So what we need to do is understand the disease early, identify the disease early, initiate the therapy early, identify which are the flags, which are the sort of risk factors which can worsen our condition, worsen COPD, and treat it immediately, okay? Those are the factors which are important. The most important thing is, unlike all the diseases, this is preventable disease. And how do we prevent it? Smoking cessation. Now there is also an understanding that, you know, okay, I smoked before, the damage is done. Why do I, why do I stop it now? But it has been shown in several experiments, several studies, several epidemiological data that patients who have damage of the lung if they continue to smoke, the damage goes on and on. There's a progressive damage of the lung with worsening lung function, and those are the patients who do not respond significantly to the treatment. So it's never late to quit. That's the first line. Okay? Always, when you realize that it is a bad, bad sort of, uh, um, it, is, it is the factor which can affect or damage your lung, any day is a good day to quit, and there are several ways to take assistance in quitting. Quitting is not easy. However, we have several mechanisms which can help in quitting. And uh, in some cases, patients can't be cured, but in other cases, there are few types of COPD. We do have a cure, okay? But there are absolutely specific types, like genetic type of COPDs we can cure, okay? What is the burden of COPD? Why do, why do I feel that it is something I need to tell every patient and we need to be aggressive about the treatment? Because it's the fourth leading cause of death. You know? Everybody knows about hypertension, heart diseases. Everybody knows about cancer. Everybody knows of cardiovascular diseases. But COPD is not so much talked about. Certainly, the fact that it's the fourth leading cause, so many people die with this disease. Certainly, we need to do many more things many more advancement in the care to improve patients' lives, right? 
in about uh, in 2000, um, the WHO estimated that there were 2.74 million people died because of COPD in the world. So that is a significant number of uh, deaths due to COPD. In 1990, it was a 12th ranking cause of uh, sort of disease burden. However, if you look at the profile over the years since 1990, what has happened? There's a more and more, there's increase in the death rate. So it's worsening day by day. Okay. So whatever the measures we are doing are not adequate enough. So we need to be more aggressive, more educative, and more uh, provide more therapies. Okay. What is COPD? How does it present? The first first presentation is shortness of breath. Okay. Certainly you can't breathe. You can't take a deep breath. You are not able to get air in, air into your lung, and you feel there is a sort of sensation of unsatisfactory, an unsatisfactory breath, okay, or inadequate breath, and that's what is the first symptom. Estimated 12 million patients have it, but they don't notice it, because, you know, over the period of time, over the period of time as age advances, our pace slows. You, know, you don't walk fast, don't do things which you don't, you don't climb up the stairs, so what happens, you're not stressing yourself to that particular level to identify that, yes, you have, limit, you have developed the limitations. And that is the reason many a times patients understand that, oh, you know, because I'm slow, I have, I have slowed down, or I'm unable to walk a few blocks is because, because of my sort of, uh, you know, growing age. It's not the case. It may be something behind that causing that, and we do need to look into that. And particularly if we, take their lung function, we realize that, yes, it is something else. It's a damage to the lung. That's what is causing it. And mm -hmm. even if you have heard COPD, there may be, there are some surprising facts I can give you, and maybe, you know, well, we'll all learn about it. And this is, this is to show you what is happening over a period of time. If you look at the, you know, 1965 to 1998, what is happening? COPD is going very high with a peak. The coronary artery disease is going down. Stroke is going down, all of the diseases are going down, but what is happening with COPD? Certainly is going up. Okay, the fact that it is increasing uh, progressively and so much, which is 163% increase in the disease, certainly. Oh. Okay. Giving us feedback on the That's okay. So. okay. Let's see how is that to speak now. Really Hello? Can you hear me? can you hear me now? Is it better? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it is the fact that you know what bothers us is that all of the diseases the death rates are going down, but in COPD it's going up. That's worrisome. That means we need to do much more uh, sort of aggressive work to identify what is the problem and how do you treat it, okay? So um, if you look at, again, here, if you compare the accidents and other, other problems, including heart, if you look at the heart, this is heart disease, this is cancer, this is stroke. Look, this is accident. So significant decrease in accident we have. Diabetes is stable, but the COPD is increasing. So if we compare every possible problem which is occurring, one thing which is constantly going up is COPD. So certainly we need to be aggressive about it. So what are the other symptoms? COPD usually causes no or mild symptoms at first, and if it diagnosed at that time, certainly we can do a lot about it. We can prevent further damage. As the disease progresses, symptom usually worsens, okay? Symptoms include cough or spit, you know? Spit, the, the spit can be a mucus, which is white color sometimes. Occasionally, you can have recurrent infection. It's known that the patients with COPD can have recurrent episode of infection. And many a times, by definition, we see that at least they have two or three episodes of, of respiratory infection. They're present with these episodes with respiratory infection. And the problem with that, with every respiratory um, episode, every episode of respiratory infection, there is a decrease in lung function. More episode you have, more decrease in lung function. So it affects your health. So we need to prevent that. 
What are the other factors? What are the other symptoms? Wheezing, there's a whistling noise which occurs. So that's a wheeze, okay? Um, suddenly, that particular wheezing noise, which is that means what is happening is a narrowing of the airway. Your airways are going into spasm. Shortness of breath with activity and rest. Suddenly, you know, initially it is activity. Initially, you will notice you're not able to climb up the stairs or, you know, walk a few blocks. But later on, as the disease progress, the COPD or the shortness of breath occurs at rest. People are not able to do their daily activity like buttoning the shirt, combing the hair, or taking a shower, which are daily routine activity you have done all life. Fatigue, fatigue and tiredness. Fatigue and tiredness certainly you know, occurs is because it's like when you're breathing, you're running, a, you're doing a marathon, you're, all your muscles are functioning, working hard, take a breath. So it's like you are working very hard and doing marathon, suddenly you're gonna consume more and more energy and that's what gives rise to more and more fatigue. Also, there is a loss of muscle mass. If you have, re if you have noticed that you know, patients who are breathing hard, they consume so much of energy that there's a, uh, the chest wall muscle, extremity wall muscle, lower extremity wall muscle, the diaphragm all get thinned down and that actually contributes and worsens further uh, shortness of breath because you need muscle strength. The breathing is a muscular act, you know, it is like an active process. That means you need several muscle. The diaphragm contributes to 75% of the breathing and other muscles like chest wall muscles, the nose muscles, the neck muscles contribute the rest. So if your muscle mass goes down, what will happen? The patients will have to work harder. Certainly it worsens the process, okay? Morning headaches. Morning headaches is a sign of hypoxemia. That means you know patients are not maintaining their oxygen. So when they get up in the morning, they'll get a headache. It's very often it happens. Of course, there are other conditions too can give rise to headache, but this is particularly uh, very often seen in patients with COPD. How do we diagnose this? Certainly clinical diagnosis, you know, we as a physician, we need to keep our eyes and ear open when the patient walks in, you know, when the pa if, the, if the patients have cough, sputum, and shortness of breath. Those are the three symptoms, typical symptoms. There's a contribution of risk factors. Risk factors are certainly, you know, first, if you take the list of the risk factor, first 10 risk factors are smoking, 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 and smoking, okay? then. Certainly, some of the patients are exposed to occupational. I know there are, there are several patients who worked in shipyard and Navy, in military, in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, sand environment. Um, certainly, they are exposed to uh, lots of uh, occupational dust, which can cause damage. There are, there are some patients who worked in engineering firms, you know, painting, uh, cutting, uh, plastering uh, boards, which also can give rise to dust. Cement can give rise to dust, and that can cause damage to their lung. Indoor and outdoor pollution. You know, for, for many years, we had underrated the pollution, what, can, what it can do. However, we now realize even the indoor pollution inside our house, the indoor pollution can also cause progressive damage. And particularly, this is important for secondhand smokers. That means, you know, if somebody, if you're smoking at home, and if you have people around, people who are smoking that, inhaling that particular smoke, will also get equal damage. Not only they are predisposed to COPD, but they are predisposed to having cancer. So it is extremely important to control indoor pollution as well as outdoor pollution. The second point which is underrated is fireplace. All of now California has a rule that fireplaces are new, in new houses are banned. However, burning wood creates similar kind of uh, you know, oxidative stress element which can cause damage to the DNA and damage to the, uh, damage to the uh, uh, damage to the lung structure causing COPD. What is the test we do? Uh, one particular test, which is lung function test, or also we call it spirometry, which is the, there's a um, sort of a, a space chamber wherein patient blows in and we can measure how much is the capacity and how much is the volume. And that tells us how good are the muscle functioning. Sorry. No. Um, so, I reduce that. It may be just the uh, contact. Um, so, how good are the? Okay. 
and the level of level of lung function can um, can identify the severity of the problem. Not only it can identify the severity of problem, we'll be able to monitor. That means this year from next year, or next year to next 10 years, how patients are they responding to the treatment or are they worsening? So do we need to be more aggressive? Do we need to add to the therapy? What is happening to the oxygenation? Can we, can we, do they need addition of oxygen? All these things can be identified by a lung function test, okay? There is another test which is called as six minute walk, okay? This is a golden test which was identified in patients with COPD. Very simple test, okay? Very simple test. What it means is exactly what it says, six minute walk. That means you walk for six minutes and check for oxygen, okay? What we do is we have a pulse oximeter, we strap it to the patients, make them walk for six minutes and see if there is a drop in oxygen, okay? Now what does it tell? It tells us whether you are able to compensate for required lung volume when you walk, whether you are able to maintain the oxygen when you are walking or when you are doing activity, and is your um, lung compensating for the required oxygen, oxygen uh, sort of demand of your body, okay? Three things. It also can tell us where is the problem. Is, the, is there a problem? There can be several level of problem. Is there a problem for air to go in or air to diffuse out, oxygen to diffuse out, or the oxygen from uh, oxygen extraction into the blood cells and taken to the organ? So we'll be able to differentiate. So the six minute walk is a golden test and it can tell us how much you can exert, how good you do, how good you behave, how good your lung function is maintained, and also this particular test can be used to monitor over a period of time. Say you did today that particular test, we can do it after the year, after one year, and see how, whether you're progressing or whether you are, uh, whether you're improving by the treatment, or the, is the treatment effective, we'll be able to know that. Okay. So what is the classification of COPD? I just wanted to give you a little bit of data, a little bit of information. Now, there is, a, um, there is a big consortium called as GOLD, okay? GOLD is not a gold metal gold, but it's a global um, organization or, or uh, you know, against, uh, against uh, obstructive airway disease, okay? Of, or it's called as LD is a lung disease, obstructive lung disease. Now, GOLD is a consortium which deals with obstructive lung diseases, and they classify this particular disease into mild, moderate, severe, and very severe, okay? Now, the, all the classification, it depends on the lung function status. If you have any time gone to the doctors and if they show you the numbers, this is what is called as, you know, what you call FEV1. That is, you know, when you blow out, how much you can blow out? Okay, that's what it tells us, okay? And if you have 80% and above, that as compared to your normal control, that means you're normal. That's what, is, uh, that's what we understand. However, the first sign of decrease of, of a disease comes with this particular number. So when we do the test, we look at the number. If your FE1 is less than that, yes, you have a mild disease. You may not be symptomatic at all, but this could be first symptoms. Now, you can imagine that, yes, you know, your lung function is down, below 80%, but still you're not symptomatic. Why is doctor telling you you have COPD? It is because you still have 80% lung function. So that 80% lung function is taking, taking over all your activity. So you're able to do everything what you were doing. However, you have the COPD disease. So at that stage, early stage, we need to be aggressive and we need to treat you, okay? Second, uh, stage two is a moderate disease where, you know, if everyone goes down to um, between 50 to 80, between 50 and 80% of predicted, okay? Stage three is a th serious or severe disease where, I didn't do anything. <laughs> where the, in severe disease, uh, the FE1 falls down to 30%, between 30 and 50%. And uh, stage four is a severe disease where uh, FE1 goes down to 30%. Okay, now this particular number is also important because you know, there are several other decisions we make on this number. If your FE1 is certain at certain level, then you can go for surgery. If it is at certain level, you can go for a transplantation or if you need any other surgery, some, may, some, some people may need hip, some people need cardiac surgery, 
all this is based on FEV1. If FEV1 is optimum level, you should be able to, we can, uh, we can sort of guarantee that you should be able to go through that particular, withstand the stress of surgery or stress of procedure. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is a particular a number which is sort of uh, very valuable for every patient. Now what happens? How does the COPD occurs? It is the it is the noxious agents. I'm getting all the electronics off of me. Uh, so it is the noxious agent. Noxious agent is a toxic agent. So what, what does tobacco do? Tobacco has, you know, if you look at the, we analyze the tobacco, and we have about 3,000 carcinogens in, the, in tobacco. And there is another element, which is nicotine. Everybody knows nicotine about. But nicotine has a different action. And both of these, the toxic agent, the, the carcinogen, or, to, or, or tissue damaging agents in, in smoke, as well as nicotine, they work synergistically and cause worsening of the damage, okay? In addition to that, existing air pollution, occupation agent can put a fuel in a fire. So if you're a smoker, if you're working in the dusty environment, and if you have a indoor air pollution, then you know, it's sort of good setting. It's a uh, tremendous setting that you can have this particular problem. What are the other factors? Well, some people have genetic factor, okay? And that's called as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now this particular is a gene, alpha-1 antitrypsin gene, and the gene is deficient in some people. Because of this particular deficiency, there is a, uh, there is certain product, certain protein, which has to be maintained in the lung to maintain the consistency or what we call viability of lung function. That does not happen, and all the lung structures get broken down. But the presentation is like COPD. However, this cannot be treated with any other medication, so the medication's treatment should be alpha-1 antitrypsin. So these are the patients, if we, if we give them alpha-1 antitrypsin or if we do lung transplantation, they, they get cured, okay? Other, uh, other reason is recurrent respiratory infections. You know, all of us get flu or viral infections uh, at least, you know, a couple of times in, in few years. However, if the patients are getting frequent infection, that can progressively cause damage to the lung and certainly worsen the lung function. It is also known that particularly COPD per se, they are more prone to get infection because the airways are damaged and airways have a, a wall of cell, cells and that cell, wall of cells, they have brush border. You know, you can imagine an escalator, how it moves. There's a brush border which moves like an escalator. The function of that escalator is anything what goes in, anything dust particles, infections go in, that particular microciliary escalator moves up and throws it out. So you're able to cough it out. Now what happens when there is smoking damage or inhalation toxic agent damage, that particular escalator gets damaged. So you're not able to get the particles out or agents out. So what, what is the effect? Certainly those particles get retained inside. So airway clearance, it's damage. The damage of airway clearance causes retention of infective agent, bacteria, viruses, or any other material which predisposes patients with COPD for more and more and more and recurrent infections. What happens is that it sort of sets in a vicious cycle. More infections, more damage, worse, infect, worse lung function, more infection, more damage, worse lung function. So we certainly need to be aggressive in bringing out, you know, educating patients to bring out the secretions, do airway clearance, and there are airway clearance devices which are available. One of them is called as flutter valve, F-L-U-T-T-E-R, flutter valve, and another one is called as acapella. Acapella is the acapella playing, so similar to that. And these are two of the plastic devices and we use routinely in our patient. What do they do? They create air current. They do not have any medications, but they create air current so that patients are able to, same thing, the air current sort of is created in the lung, so you're able to move your, uh, the secretions or whatever the particles are up, and you're able to cough up. So it helps in airway clearance. The moment, you have, moment it helps in airway clearance, your breathing is better. Infection chances are less, so you're able to maintain your lung function, sustain for a long time. 
So these are the so the path uh, so our therapy is specifically focused to the pathogenesis. What are the what are the reasons what it happens and how do we treat it? So if we know the reasons, we are able to treat it. And certainly, tough for the most is stoppage stoppage of smoking or smoking cessation. Is you can't beat that to any of the therapy available. Now I ta I told you about the two types of COPD. One is chronic bronchitis and another is emphysema. Now chronic bronchitis, these individuals retain more carbon dioxide and car that's why they are, they look blue. Some of them have bluish tinge lips, bluish nails and you can, you know that bluish hue occurs in them. While emphysema, emphysema are, you know, they have pink. They're pink puffers, and that's called that's what called, they are called as pink puffers. And they have pink lips, so they're able to oxygenate. Uh, okay, so that is emphysema. Okay, and and I'm going to show you the pictures here. Okay, so the blue bloaters look like this. They're a little bit overweight, but you know it's it's a bloated up. You know because there is a retention of water, retention. There's a pressure on the heart, which causes a lot of retention of water. While Emphysema, which are pink puffers, are skinny, they lose muscle mass, and not able to, um, are not able to breathe, and they have pink lips, so pink puffer. Now, in, in a chronic bronchitis, the blue bloater syndrome is seen in obese individuals who may suffer from inadequate blood oxygenation. The, this is most sort of obvious when they are sleeping. There is a heart and breathing problem associated with it. These patients do have cough and sputum at least three to 12 months of a year, you know, once, once at least one to two episode or one to three episode in a year they get. The lip and skins will be bluish tinge. Swelling of arm and leg, the leg edema will occur, okay? And prognosis may vary depending on what is there, how much is the pressure on their heart, how much is the effect on, on the other organs, okay? How about the pink pfeffer, emphysema? Emphysema are of a little, you know, category with a better prognosis. Um, a pink puffer syndrome are these individuals, they look pink, their lips are pink. These individuals are thin, they are underweight, and they may breathe through the pursed lip. Pursing of the lip is, yes, that's right. The pursing of the lip, that literally purse, closing of the lip. And this particular act occurs is because there is an absolute physiological mechanism involved in it. The pursing of the lip creates a back pressure so that that back pressure prevents closure of the lung. So the lung structure, the structure architect is like a balloon, sacs, okay? Now when you don't have that surface tension to maintain that structure, okay, you need to have some pressure which can maintain that. So patients automatically learn to do that, okay? So that pressure, back pressure, keeps their lungs open so that for the next breath they are able to take it in. Otherwise, what happens if they're not able to, alveolars get collapse, collapse, collapse. It's like collapsing balloon. So when next time the breath comes in, there is not much of uh, sort of uh, uh, space for them to open up, okay? And sticky alveolar don't open up very quickly. And that's why it is the pursing lip mechanism helps, okay? But when we look at the patients, you know, well, well, we can identify where the patients are. Uh, they fall into blue bird or pink puffer category. And if you look at that, this is what it looks like. You know, emphysema is, you see that dark thing? So this is all air. All of us have air. This is a heart, okay? These are our uh, clavicles, okay? These are our diaphragm. Now look, you know, generally, you know, the diaphragm and the heart are touching each other. But you can see a lot of air. It's like, looks like it's a it's sort of elevated person. So that this is because, you know, the patient is hyperinflated and trying to breathe on that. And that's what is, that's what the, more air, trapped air in the lung give rise to that particular um, blackish sort of tinge, blackish uh, image. Also, if you look at the heart gets sort of pulled because the diaphragm is pulled down, so chest becomes tall, and that's what happens in sort of over-expanded chest. If you look at this, you know, this is what mild COPD looks like, you know. There is a hyperinflation. See, look, that diaphragms are well-placed. It's a tall, thin person, however, the stretch heart is not stretched like this. Look at that, this is hyperinflated. This particular area is sort of inflated and that's what uh, upper chest is inflated and that tells us that this is over hyperinflation. So this is severe, severe COPD and this is a mild COPD, okay? This is a severe, this is a mild. Now what, what, do, what do I mean by SACS? And this is actually, you know, I've, 
I've shown some picture, I've drawn some picture how, how it looks like. So we have right and left lung, okay? Now, right and left lung. And right and left lung, there's an airway tube which goes in the center and divides into two, okay? Now, every, the distal part of the lung, it's like an air sac. It's like, you can imagine a bunch of grapes, but the grapes are with, with air, empty, empty uh, sort of sacs. And this, these sacs, the units of sacs form, are formed by the lobes. The, the lobes uh, come together and form a lung, okay? Now what happens, you know, in normal, these sacs are, normal these sacs are sort of, they have cellular lining, they have blood supply outside, so air comes in, gas get exchanged, oxygen comes in, carbon dioxide goes out, and the carbon dioxide, um, the air with mixed with CO2 or carbon dioxide goes out. Now what happens in emphysema, see that the structure gets broken, see here? So it becomes like a, you know, empty holes. So you can imagine, see, if these are the alveoli, what will happen? It will sort of, it, sort of patchy area because the part of the lung is broken. So there is a surface area, but it's like empty sacs, a big sacs. Now what happens is, because there is a stretching and big sac, there aren't any blood supply going to that particular area for the exchange of gas, okay? Oxygen, for oxygen to diffuse, there has to be a blood supply outside. If there is a lot of stretching of the septas, you're not gonna have blood supply, which is adequately sort of uh, participating into gas exchange. As a result, what happens? The surface area is reduced, and the diffusion is reduced, and that's why patients come with drop in oxygenation, okay? And the six minute walk will show they're not able to maintain their oxygenation, okay? So the, the, there are four components we should look into management, okay? The four components, and these are the gold guidelines, and actually, you know, you can also look into the guidelines. It will also give you more understanding and what is going on in the world. This is, this is where it's available, and this is actually um, developed by WHO and uh, American Thoracic Society and CDC, as well as, you know, all of the consortium that are topmost people come together to put these data and put these sort of uh, workshop report for all physicians to follow, all patients to follow, so that we can give uniform, high quality care to the patient. Now, the first thing, what we need to do, assess and monitor the disease. That means when the patient walks in, assess what is the extent of the disease. If this is a mild, moderate, severe, and monitor. Don't let the patient go, you know, okay, you have COPD, go home, no. We need to do, perform monitoring at a periodic level, come back, see whether the patients are deteriorating or improving. That periodic monitoring will, will be extremely valuable to assess how is the patient progressing with the disease or is he or she responding to the treatment, okay? Reduce risk factors, okay? So certainly smoking cessation, environment, occupational, everything has to be taken into account and everything has to be improved and dealt with. Um, I do not know uh, all, phys all primary care physicians do, you, do talk to you about, uh, about the environment and pollution, but as a pulmonologist, and particularly I'm interested in environmental effect in the lung, I do ask every patient, where do they work, what do they do, what exactly they do. What do they, in the, some peop people say, that, oh, I work in a factory, but what is your job in the factory? Are you exposed to the dust? Or if you're not exposed to the dust, what do you do? Oh, I, if, you are, if you may be a supervisor who is walking in a dusting environment, well, you may not do the work in the dust, but if you're walking in the dusty environment, you are exposed because you inhale. Do you use a mask when you do all these work? Do you, do you burn fire? Do you do camping and you know, make a bonfire there? So those all can cause sort of damage to the lung. And we need to know all these factors because every small factors, you can imagine 10 factors together will cause a, long more, a lot more uh, sort of damage to the lung. So each and every factor is important. Manage the stable disease. That means, you know, when the patients are stable, okay, when they are minimum, minimal symptomatic, not progressing, manage the disease at that time. Give them, give them therapy. Give them a bronchodilator, give them other therapy, and sort of smoking cessation, education, pharmacological, non-pharmacological therapy, and manage them well. And the most important of all the components, of all these three components, is education. If you know what is wrong with you, you will be able to treat the disease better, okay? And all patients can, the treatment is partnership. That means patient's partnership with the physician, understanding how the process goes. And if we both understand each other, then there's nothing better than, uh, you know, uh, having the best of the care in patients.
okay. And manage exacerbation, we know that there are exacerbation which occurs either inflammation or, or they can be infection. So manage immediately, so specific therapy to the management and also rehabilitation, oh sorry, um, rehabilitation in the sense when the patients go home after the after COPD exacerbation, we need to guide them, we need to tell them how to get back to the, their regular life. Okay? That is the most important part of it. That means patients who are lying on a bed for some time or uh, sick for some time won't be able to go back, walk, do their daily activity, you know, do the laundry or go shopping, go to the grocery. So we need to develop that, build that up over a period of time slowly, gradually develop it. It's like a baby steps you need to take. And we have to, as a physician, we have to educate and train patients before they go out of the hospital that, okay, these are the steps we need to do. This is how you're gonna get. Don't, don't, don't feel bad if you're not able to do it within a week. Maybe it will take a couple of weeks to go ahead. But these are extremely important in the management of COPD. <clears throat> now, the, what are the risk factors, other risk factors? The other risk factors, actually, they stratify according to the severity of the disease. Now, the therapy, depending on the severity of the disease, everyone must get flu vaccination, okay? All of you, have, have you all taken flu vaccination? Good. Flu vaccination is a most preventive strategy, okay? Flu is a commonest killer. <clears throat> it's a frequent, frequent infection, frequent, uh, a viral infection, very often um, patients get it. However, um, flu vaccination can be protective. And there is also a question that, oh, but you know, every time I get the flu, I get the vaccine, I get sick. And I do get patients uh, asking me that. There is a caveat behind it, you know, flu vaccination is not 100% proof. However, most of the flus can be prevented. And if not prevented, the severity of the problem is reduced. That means patients, who have been vaccinated, if they get pneumonia, if they get really sick, if they get into ICU, their sort of disease remains limited and you know, death rates are less. So in the long run, even if you get, say, God forbid, if the, if the infection occurs, <clears throat> the infection severity is reduced. And that has been seen not only in adults, but also in kids. So vaccination is the most important key. <clears throat> what are the other measures you do? Short acting bronchodilators. Now bronchodilators, it's a self-explaining self word. Bronco is a bronchus, the, the airway, airway, the tubes, airway tube. Dilator is an opening. So this particular medication opens the airway, okay? The bronchodilator, all of you may have heard, Albutrol, Zoponex, Atroban, Spiriva, Advair, all of these are bronchodilators. And depending on the severity of the disease, depending on the status, certainly bronchodilators can improve uh, the breathing status. <clears throat> then the regularity of treatment, that means a combination. Patient, if the patients have, look at that, moderate to severe disease, that means if the lung function is between 50 and lower, okay, then we have to act, add a long-acting medication, which long-acting can take care of your breathing for 12 hours, and then repeat dose at 12 hours, so twice a day, and then add a short acting whenever you need to do something. Say you wanna go and uh, go to grocery, okay? Then you have a short acting bronchodilator. So you take a stable long acting medication and take a puff of, uh, puff of your short acting so it gives you that enough um, sort of uh, bronchodilatation to do your activity. Same is add rehabilitation. Pulmonary rehabilitation is extremely important in patients with COPD. Now this is also, this is the only thing which has shown to cause uh, sort of improvement in patients' well-being. That means, you know, the rehabilitation, which is a control exercise, control breathing exercise, and control a skeletal muscle exercise, improves the muscle activity, improves your breathing capacity, and improves force of contraction. See, if a diaphragm can forcefully contract, you can take the breath more in, you can deep breathe deeper. So certainly, that rehabilitation is extremely important. Rehabilitation is also important pre and post surgery. Any surgery, if you're going for a plan, organized surgery, say somebody has a, um, say, orthopedic surgery which are organized or, or planned, or cardiac surgery which is planned, you can go to a rehab, get yourself trained and ready for, the, ready for that particular event. Particularly in lung transplantation, we, what we do, we send the patient for, to rehab, get them 
to that particular level, okay? Get them trained in rehab, get their muscles under control so that they can uh, sustain the trauma of surgery and come out of the, come out of the surgery flying, with flying colors, and that is extremely important. Other to, uh, on the other hand, there is also a rehabilitation re is required when you get out of the hospital, okay? If the patients are sick when they, when they get out of the hospital, to get back to their feet, you need rehabilitation. If there are trauma, injury, fractures, certainly rehabilitation is important. Then next is adding glucocorticoid. Okay, glucocorticoids, you know, glucocorticoids are steroids, okay? Now, when we say steroids, you know, some people say, oh, we, we don't want to use steroids. But these particulars have, they are in micro, micro dosage, and they are delivered directly into the airway. That means you inhale it. So when you inhale it, what happens, the inhaled particles, they line into the alveolar warning, that is the, into the, um, uh, they lie on the airway surfaces, and what, what it does, sort of it creates some of the signal transduction reaction and causes bronchodilatation, decreases inflammation. So the action of glucocorticoid locally, it's significantly improved. It improves the uh, effect of bronchodilator, and it also decreases inflammation. So not only short term it improves, it immediately improves bronchodilatation, but since it improves, it suppresses inflammation, what will happen? Inflammation goes down, patient will do better, right? They will have less exacerbation, they will have less worsening, um, worsening uh, dyspnea. So this is particular combination was, particularly in asthma, it works a lot, uh, lot more significantly as, than, as compared to COPD. In COPD, only in moderate and severe condition, we use corticosteroids. Okay, then oxygen therapy. Again, vital, very, very, very vital. Um, so what happens is because of the damage to the alveolar wall, as I showed you the alveolar sac, the sac, sac get damaged. Because of the damage to the sac, the gas diffusion is reduced. That means oxygenated air goes in, the diffusion of oxygen from the, from the alveoli to the blood is reduced because you don't have enough surface, okay? Now, reduction of the, that surface causes hypoxemia. That means hypoxemia, we notice in the blood gas, when we do the blood gas test, we'll see the oxygen is low. When we do pulse oximetry, particularly the six minute pulse oximetry, we'll find that your oxygen is low. Anything below 89% of pulse oximetry, you need, will need an oxygen. Patients should be put on oxygen therapy, okay? We also do measure the oxygen level. How much is it required? So what we do is first measure how much is a low, how much is a drop in oxygen. Then you strap the oxygen and see whether they can maintain above 90, 91%. That is important. Yeah, the patients have to, with oxygen, they have to be able to maintain nighttime oxygen. Now there are two other additional things I want to tell you with oxygen therapy. One is that stress and exertion decreases oxygen. Okay, decrease, because it increases oxygen demand, it will decrease the saturation. Okay, so that means your stressful condition will require more oxygen. So if you're climbing the stairs or doing ex exercise or doing treadmill, you will have to increase the oxygen, okay? Now secondly, sleeping, okay? We have noticed that um, there are several studies we did with pulse oximetry, patients who, some patients who do not, even do not have hypoxemia may drop their oxygen during night. And there are several mechanisms happens, you know, our brain wants to sleep, that's one thing. Secondly, when you lie down, the diaphragm goes up, so thoracic volume is reduced. Abdominal organs go up, thoracic volume is reduced. So per se, you have less volume, okay? And thirdly, you know, uh, sometimes this, the uh, lax muscle, what we call obstruction occurs, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, your tongue falls down and airway sort of gets compromised. And it's not serious enough, but you know, serious enough to cause a drop in oxygenation and it compromise your long-term well-being. How does it compromise long, how, how does it compromise long-term well-being? It is because over a period of time, if you have drop in oxygenation every night, your heart has to work harder to supply for the oxygen. So what you're doing is giving a marathon run to your heart. Okay. After a while, heart gets tired and says, oh, I'm not working. It's going to be, there will be increased pressure. So these patients get increased right heart pressure. That is called as pulmonary hypertension. So the increased right heart pressure occurs because your oxygen is low. However, if we, if we supply with the oxygen therapy, boom, you know, patients are 
to patients do well, they improve well, the um, drop in oxygen doesn't occur, heart is happy and the body is happy. So it is extremely important that we have these particular uh, event. It's also important that we need to have periodic monitoring over a period of time. That means once you have oxygen doesn't mean you will have always oxygen, okay? There are, there are time comes and go, you know. There are some times that patients will have pneumonia or infection, they will need oxygen, but once the pneumonia is better, they will get better. There are some patients may need it. Some patients may need it just when they do exertion or just when they do activity, exercise, or when they sleep, and that is fine too. However, the bottom line is, no matter what, you have to maintain your oxygen level, saturation level above 89%. If you maintain above 89%, that means your mm -hmm. blood oxygen remains above 60, and that is optimum for the level. You don't need to have 100%, 60 is good enough, okay? What are the medications? I think many of you have seen this, okay? This is Ventolin, this is Proventil, this is generic Albuterol, this is Maxair, this is Albuterol Nebulize, um, this is Pyreva, uh, actually now it comes in an egg shape sort of thing. This is Airwear, okay? This is um, Simbacot, and um, this is the newer one, Dolera, okay? Now, all of these inhalers, they have, some of them are short acting, some of them are long acting. The mechanism action, the delivery, the functions are identical, okay? Some of these medications do have combination of corticosteroids and and bronchodilator. As I told you, the corticosteroids and bronchodilator, they act synergistically. That means if you give corticosteroids, if you give bronchodilator, the action, it, it will be not one, one as to one, two, it will be one as to one, five. That means the action of the bronchodilator is better. So that's why, um, you know, these two medications are given together. Of course, some of the pharmaceutical agents became brilliant and they decided to get the combination so that, you know, you can take just one medication. So that's what, you know, some of those adware Simbacot are, are those. Now, the question is, what is better for me or what is better for any patient? So there is no hard and fast rule which is better for which one. It depends on what, what the patient tolerates. But there are certain criteria we select into. For smoking-induced damage, Atrovent is the, is the medication which is sort of tolerated by patients well. There's a cholinergic drive which, is, which are regulated and the patients respond well. The bronchodilator like Albutrol, Maxair, uh, Zoponex, all, uh, they all work at the same level, okay? The Zoponex per se, the liver Albutrol. Now this is, this has particular peculiar action, which is cardioprotective. That means, you know, all these medications, they act on the receptors in, in our lungs, okay? The, the receptors, some of the receptors are shared by lung and the heart. So when we take Albutrol and like Proventil Ventorlin, they are common, so they act on the lung and heart both. So you may have realized that when you take puff of albuterol, there's a jitneriness and there is a palpitation. So that's an effect of because both stimulation occurs. Now, the, so scientists looked into how can we prevent that. So the liver albuterol is a selective, uh, cardio selective. That means it leaves the cardiac receptors away and sort of focuses on, on the lung. So it's a better one. However, still there are, there are missed receptors. You know, some of the patients do get, it's not 100% proof, some patients do get tachycardia and palpitations with that. Um, long acting, certainly, you know, moderate to severe disease, we need long acting medications. And long acting are Advair, Simbacot, and, uh, you know, Foradel, um, as well as Cerevent, you may have realized that. And those are long acting medications must be given 12 hourly. One most important thing, if, if the patients are using inhaled corticosteroids, the first and most important thing is to do is immediately after taking the puff, rinse your mouth, okay? It's important because the corticosteroid particle, if they remain in posterior pharynx, it can give rise to candida infection. It's a fungus infection, like a, you know, baby uh, when they get sort of, uh, what do you call? Um, uh, yeah, thrush, exactly, thrush, yeah. So it's, it's called as oral thrush, exactly. So, so to prevent that, uh, Rinsing is certainly important, and you can imagine, you know, in our mouth and nose, everything goes, whatever is going on in the world. So we got to prevent our nose, and mouth, pro or protect them. So what are the inhaled corticosteroids? Beclomethasone or uh, QR, Palmacort, which is bedazinamide, Aerobid, which is uh, um, Aerobid, which is uh, also a um, uh, corticosteroid, Flovent, Advil, Asmacort, Elvesco. All these are different name, different company. Uh, they have somewhat similar product, they have somewhat similar action, 
can be used anything so but the uh, well there is a complement too <laughs> there is um coming back so um so complement is a combination of albuterol and atrovent were together and certainly systemic corticosteroids are prednisone and methylprednisone we give uh, we give in these uh, in some of the patients okay now what are the uh, other medications what are the other things what we do okay other are um, inhaled uh, inhaled um, aerosolized or um, airway um, airway clearance devices that means some patients have sticky secretions are unable to bring them we can give some saline inhalation <coughs> so normal saline inhalation or 3% normal saline inhalation and that can also with along with acapella and along with nebulizer can help to bring up the secretions okay now other therapies are that will include certainly a preventive strategy preventive strategy will be take vaccination do rehabilitation pulmonary rehab okay do exercise pulse oximetry and monitor yourself the periodic monitoring cannot replace anything okay what are the other other ways you can prevent copd so no, protective strategy protective strategy is prevent and educate prevention is go over all your environment smoking quit smoking and educate your younger generation it has been shown that the children between 9 and 16 smoke the most and if that is that is a statistic in midwest okay if children get hooked on smoking it is difficult for them to uh, get rid of yes it is addicting so it's difficult to uh, difficult for them to get rid of so education 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 and education that can prevent and certainly preventive strategy is important what are the other therapies there are options which are very rarely we use but there are options like surgical therapy now some patients who have localized disease what i what i showed you there is something called as volume reduction surgery the volume reduction surgery is we have a good team who does that and if you have a localized part of the lung which is hyper inflated like a sac that particular lung can be removed if you remove that particular other lung can expand now this procedure is only effective if there is a selective choice that means you need to select the patients patient selection is extremely important somebody who has diffuse emphysema somebody who has blue bloater you can do that okay it has to be selectively in patients uh, with localized disease it does significantly improve the breathing because that particular hyperinflated area comes out and the lung which is which is compressed gets expanded and lung is good in taking over the position you know once the seat gets over you know empty the lung takes over so if you remove the lobe lung will expand so it's a good thing that lung gets expanded so so compensation and overcompensation occurs very quickly and we have a fantastic surgery team uh, of Shari, dr shagar and all have has several years of experience in doing these surgery with a good outcome however bottom line is it's not for everybody it's for very 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 selected patient and depends on how they present and what is their uh, examination or radiological examination look like the other resort last resort is transplantation there are patients who can who can undergo or who may undergo transplantation there is a facility available and you know stanford has a has a good transplantation program it's also uh, possible to do single lung or double lung that means you know some patients can get just one organ one lung is good enough to breathe so that you know the one lung can compensate um however again the most important factors are selection of the patient everybody cannot go through that and it is lung transplantation is of course certainly a very tedious job there is a lot more involvement lot more maintenance involved lot more um, input from the patient and lot more commitment is involved in that not only that there has to be a maintenance of immunosuppression therapy over a period of until you live because you have someone else's organ in the lung okay or organ in, in your chest certainly you know it can work uh, in several patients however remember that in if you have one lung and other lung is sort of disease then the infections can occur from one to other so there are chances of infection the other of all the patients do better if they don't have significant other other problems like heart disease 
stroke, hypertension, cholesterol, which are other, other factors which can compromise your breathing, okay? In both lung, both lung transplantation, of course, there's an age limit, muscle mass, activity, oxygenation, uh, other factors, cardiac, renal, all factors have to be done. And this, this is possible, so there is an option, however, selectivity and understanding is certainly required. Okay, so the bottom line is that know what it is, ask the question, treat it, identify early, treat it, and prevent, prevent, prevent. Prevention is the key and prevention it requires long-term maintenance. That means it requires daily monitoring of the patient, daily taking me medications, as well as monitoring patients periodically over a period of time. With that, you know, I will stop and uh, take some questions. And thank you very much for patiently listening to me. Hi, Christine. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. But I'm wondering how much research is being done on emphysema to, you know, it seems like when you understand what's going on in the lungs, especially if it's diffuse, that there's nothing that can be done. But I'm wondering if there is any research. Yeah. So, so there is a lot of research work is going on currently, but nothing that can translate into patient trial as yet. Okay. It's because, see, the lung problem, the COPD has not only the smoking element, but the environment, and it's difficult to control the environment. And there are studies going on looking at how nicotine and smoking can cause damage and how we can prevent that. The oxidative stress damage can be prevented. If we can prevent the oxidative stress damage, yes, we can get the patient well or prevent it. Now, there is also a component that can we regenerate the lung back? That means if you have those sacs which are damaged there, can we regenerate? Certainly we're looking into stem cells, stem cells which can regenerate. However, all these are in experimental phase, okay? So the levels of research are going on in, on one side is how to prevent it, how to prevent the oxidative stress damage, okay? On second side is if there is oxidative stress damage, how do you block it? and how do you prevent further damage? So we're looking into, you know, in patients and in, in animals who have all these factors, we try to add medications and prevent that. So that's the second. Third one is how to regenerate, which is stem cell therapy, okay? And we are still in process. These are all are experimental, okay? Fourth one is can we prevent all the factors which occurs. That means complications. Complications is like, you know, hypoxemia, pulmonary hypertension. Can we prevent those? Can we improve the muscle mass? Can we give any other factors which can improve? Can we give surfactant that can improve the, improve, uh, you know, lung elasticity and other factors, diffusion? So there are experiments going on that. Um, and also experiments are going on on preventive strategy, like which vaccination can work better? What are the common organisms? How do we prevent that? How do we protect you guys? And lastly is how do we improve the diaphragmatic function? Because as I said, diaphragm takes care of 75% of the pull and muscle pull uh, function of the, of the breathing. So uh, experiments are going on on that too. Hi. Oh, uh, go ahead. Sorry. What are they doing with MAC infections? Okay. Uh, so, um, so MAC, MAC infection certainly, you know, is one of the um, common. Well, so the question was, what are they doing with MAC infection? And MAC is, you know, it's a um, mycobacterium AVM. It's a, it's an atypical tuberculosis bacteria. It's not a TB, TB, but it's an atypical tuberculosis bacteria. And it's a very good question because one of the common infection which occurs is by these bacteria, and you wouldn't believe that many a times they are in, in a, a steam bath, a shower head. These are the places these organisms come in. So there are several things going on currently that we are trying to identify the genes which are, which cause this, so bacterial genes which are resistant to the treatment and people are trying to identify what would be the characteristic and how to identify how to kill them. Basically we're learning how to kill them. That's what it is because what we want is we want effective therapy to kill the organism. Current therapy is, requires a year and a half of antibiotic. 
and also the organism is sticky, they stick inside the airway, it is very difficult to get rid of and causes recurrent infection. Every few months it will come up. So, we wanted to get eradication of the bacteria. To eradicate that, you need effective antibiotic which can work on future growth and current growth. So, there are science, the scientists, scientists are working on how to develop, how to identify gene and how to target the medications. Also, there is a atypical mycobacterial consortium which uh, in the American Thoracic Society which puts the guidelines of different combination of therapy. So, we have newer antibiotics which combinations coming in and we are doing as, you know, as we become smarter, bacteria become smart too. You know, so bacteria develop resistant and that is a fact. So, bacteria be become resistant. So, we need to become smarter than that and sort of, sort of uh, you know, identify what are the problems and target those. So, there are antibiotic combination uh, treatment protocol as well as development into genetic profiling of the bacteria and antibacterial therapy protocols. Sir? Can you say a little bit more about rehabilitation? You yes. suggested that it could actually improve the situation. Yes. Is, it, is there a particular set of things other than just keep active? <laughs> No, yeah, oh no, 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 absolutely. And if so, how does one find out about them and, and so, start doing it? Your primary care didn't talk to you, it looks like. No, I think I'm yeah. one of the people who were told, well, you've got it and there's nothing that can be done. That's not true. <laughs> well, that's, uh, no, it is true that that's what I was told. Uh, oh, I mean, I mean, uh, what I'm, I'm saying that if you were told, Sorry. that if you were told. So, so the question is, uh, is uh, you know what what are they doing about rehabilitation and how to get the rehabilitation who to approach so the rehabilitation is a inseparable component of COPD management okay there are certain sites in in locally okay one is the sequoia okay which is very commonly you know I, I refer all my patients to sequoia there the sequoia has a fantastic rehabilitation and what what do they do they have periodic session of training your muscle, breathing exercises, improving diaphragmatic contractility, and also, you know, teach you how to breathe, like per sleeping or, you know, take a deep breath and open up your distal airway, which get <laughs> collapsed, okay? It also improves the exercise, uh, the extremity and tones of the extremity and muscle, okay? Upper extremity as well as lower extremity. Now, how does it improve? It, what it does, it's sort of, it's increasing improving your reserve. That means it's like, you know, they're training you for 5K marathon. So when, when the 5K comes in, you're already trained. So the, the progressive increase in your tolerance improves your uh, breathing capacity, improves your stability, and improve, it can make you uh, sustain the stress of infection or anything. So it does improve significantly. And certainly it does not replace the lung it does not change the pathogenesis inside the lung, but it improves the breathing because the other factors in human, in a body, because the person is own, we can't say separate our lung from the person. So all other factors improve significantly and that's what is a well-being. And also it improves sort of, it gives the patient sense of well-being. So patients do significantly better. We routinely, there are, there are three months uh, sessions generally maybe twice a week, three months, and uh, many of them are paid by the insurances also. So you can have primary care refer or pulmonologist refer to the closest rehab center. You can also uh, uh, look into that goal guideline and look into uh, closest rehab program. It's like same, you know, people have fractures, they have rehabilitation for the extremity, right? It's the same thing for the lung, we have rehabilitation. And certainly it has lot more sense of well-being and lot more sense of activity and a functional status. You are able to do daily activity. You know, most people want to do their routine work what they are doing. That's the, that's the least they want to do. And get you back on that, it's good enough. Also, they, t they tell you how to use oxygen, how not to use oxygen, what are the things, other things to look for, which is really good. They also monitor the heart rate during exercise, so it's not that you are running and your heart is racing, so that also needs to be monitored. They also have that same program at El Camino Hospital. There you go. Yeah. Sir, do you know about the Better Breeders Club? Do you know about the Better, Better Breeders Club? Yeah, I do. Oh. Why don't you tell them about it? <laughs> <laughs> they also have harmonic <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. 
Yes. So, so yes, actually that was an excellent. So there, there was a comment here, you know. Uh, this man made, made a comment, there's a harmonica, you know. So the blowing instrument, if you have a cappella, a cappella is the same, came on same thing. Um, so what happens, you take a deep breath and blow. So it's an exercise, you're exercising your lung. So I tell my patients, two best exercises are playing instrument, singing, or, uh, I mean three, singing or swimming, because you know, it takes the um, sort of upper extremity, um, upper extremity sort of improves your power and uh, works your diaphragm, so those are the best exercises to improve your lung function. Go ahead. I have pulmonary congestion, and it is in the genes. My mother had it, my grandfather had it. And um, there isn't much, I, um, I put my saline solution in each nostril every morning. So the question is, you know, um, SMAM has a pulmonary congestion, and the only treatment was given is a nasal rinses? Yes. Okay, so there are two different things here. The pulmonary congestion in, in COPD, of course, is, you know, as I so showed you, blue bloaters, mm -hmm. is because there's a increased pressure, back pressure on the heart, back pressure on the heart give rise to uh, exudation, some of the fluid into the lung, like what we call pulmonary congestion is also called as CHF or congestive heart failure, okay? So the congestion in the lung is treated by diuretics and medications which can improve the contractility of the heart and a treatment of the COPD. So the treatment of the cause will treat the pulmonary congestion, okay? Now, if it's a nasal congestion, then it's a different uh, different sort of area. The nasal congestion is because you have inflammation in the nose or allergic allergic inflammatory problems in the nose. That can be by nasal saline, nasal solution. Uh, it can be treated with that. What happens is nasal inflammation, when it occurs, it causes sinus inflammation. It goes down from the post posterior of part of the throat, which is called a post nasal drip. It goes to the lung and patients cough and also it can give rise to pneumonias. So that can be prevented by, by that. But those are two different things. So I would ask, you know, I would suggest asking your physician, if this is pulmonary congestion, then what other treatment you're giving me? Or is my heart okay? Or do I need diuretics? Do, you, do I need water pills, okay? Congestion is water. So, so there, are, there are ways to do it. And some patients who have drop in oxygenation, they need oxygen therapy also, but which may be temporary. Have the reduced oxygen saturation levels. Can that affect uh, memory? Okay, so the question is when you have reduced oxygen saturation, can it affect memory? Yes, it can. Uh, it depends, how, it has to be way low, okay? Um, but there are, there are two components of reduced oxygen. One is that there is just a reduced oxygen, which is hypoxemia, and there is a reduced oxygen and increased carbon dioxide, okay, which is hypercarbia. Now, the hypercarbia affects the sensorium much more than the oxygenation. That means if the patients have high carbon dioxide, they will get a dis little bit disoriented, not focused, or, some, or not, not able to respond. And it does happen in both COPD and, and sleep apnea. Um, but carbon dioxide affects more than the oxygen, okay? Another thing, I just want to make one comment that, you know, patients with COPD, if they drive, you know, we have seen that driving is also a stressful condition, and um, once you, if you're taking turn, or if you're waiting for the light, you will have drop in oxygen. So it is certainly, we have seen that actually in, uh, when I was in Chicago 10 years ago, we did a study on patients who, uh, uh, who had uh, oxygen therapy, and one of my colleague, brave colleague, you know, he used to take pulse oximeter, sit with the patients, and uh, monitor their pulse oximeter when they drive right, left, and right, left, and sort of, sort of, you know, go around the block. So every time patients have to pay more attention and do the job, oxygen goes down. So you can imagine if the driving, like you know, driving is something which is everybody does unknowingly. You know, it's just in your, uh, it's a routine thing. So if that causes drop in oxygen, you can imagine the routine activity which, you, which all of you do will also be uh, stressful and will cause certainly drop in oxygen. So it is important to do that six minute walk and find out what is the oxygen level and maintain that. Okay. One more question, hi. Is there any evidence about the relationship of stress and COPD? 
Okay, the question is, is there any relationship of stress with COPD? Now, there is no relationship for the etiology, but there is a relationship with how patients respond to it. Okay, stress does, you know, all pulmonary diseases, lung diseases, heart diseases have some emotional, there is called a psychosomatic component to it. And certainly stress becomes problematic, patients don't respond, the compliance of the therapy, their well-being, their exercise tolerance, all gets affected. If all these factors get affected, then they don't respond to the treatment well, okay? It's also, uh, you know, people, if you're not energetic, you're not gonna do exercise, you're not gonna do it, so that motivation also goes away. So there's a lot more factors. And it can be the people who have depression or, you know, stressful condition which can really affect their mental status or sensorium which can make them really uh, sort of uh, uh, emotionally challenged. That can also affect the well-being and sort of response to the treatment. So yes, we need to treat that, I mean, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be paid attention to with, uh, as, a, as a part of your therapy. Okay, so uh, with that. So electric vests are not for COPD, okay? Um, that is for different kind of disease. Okay, so with, the, with that, we'll, uh, we'll complete the question, we'll complete the session. And thank you all coming here, I really enjoyed that. And I hope you all learn as much as I did.